Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. Twins fascinate us, especially when they are identical. Twins have been studied for many years, both psychologically and physiologically. The most memorable and horrific of these studies was conducted by Joseph Mengele, the Nazi angel of death at the Auschwitz death camp. Other studies have followed sets of twins from birth into adulthood. Many of these studies followed identical twins who were separated at birth and raised apart to try to determine if a person's personality traits were a result of nature versus nurture. In many cases, it is definitely nature. We could devote an entire podcast to the fascinating psychology of twins, but we are going to focus on twins who murder together. Okay, on to the show. There's honestly nothing more important than taking care of yourself, because if you're not feeling your best, you can't be your best. Sambucol helps you feel your best with powerful immune support powered by nature's superfruit, black elderberry. Now listen, I'm a new mom, so I don't have time to feel down and out, so I make sure to incorporate my Sambucol in my everyday life. It has been something really, really important to start off my day. I feel like I'm taking control with Sambucol because it helps support my immune system, and I feel like I'm doing my body good by taking Sambucol every day. It has a great taste. I honestly love the gummies the best, so sometimes I feel like starting off my day with a nice warm cup of water and I'll actually use the Sambucol drink powder in there, and it tastes so good. It's really, really refreshing and makes me feel like it's an easy thing to incorporate into my wellness routine. Best of all, Sambucol is a trusted brand. It's the original black elderberry and was developed by a virologist, so I know I'm getting a great quality product, and you can too. Get 15% off your next order of $9.99 or more at sambucolusa.com. Use FAN15 for 15% off. That's sambucolusa.com. Use FAN15 for 15% off. S-A-M-B-U-C-O-L-U-S-A dot com. Use FAN15 for 15% off. In 1989, in South Dakota, 84-year-old Walter Gibbs was living in a nursing home in Hedinger, North Dakota leaving his home in Lemon, South Dakota, vacant. In February, Darlene Phillips and her twin sister, Dolores Christensen, moved into his home along with Darlene's husband, Jerome, and Dolores' daughter, Robin. Darlene and Dolores had both been married to Walter before, twice. Walter was born in Wahoo, Nebraska on August 10, 1904. He was an only child and moved with his family to Morristown, South Dakota in 1910. His family established a homestead there near Lemon, South Dakota. Walter attended the small country school before leaving school to work on the farm. When his father died, he remained on the farm to take care of his mother, hiring a young girl to help. The young girl was Dolores Wall, 18 years old at the time. Walter then, in his late 50s, married her. The marriage took place in 1964 and lasted for less than 10 years. They moved to Lemon in 1973 and divorced soon after the move. Walter and Dolores married again in 1977 and divorced the same year. Dolores married someone else and had Robin, her only child. Walter then married Dolores' twin, Darlene, but they were divorced in 1980. They were remarried again at some point, but divorced again in 1983. Walter's last marriage was to June Penny, but they divorced in 1986. When the twins moved into Walter's home in 1989, they cleaned it, readying it for Walter to move back in so they could take care of him. Over the next several months, the twins did take care of Walter. On January 5, 1990, Walter changed his will, making Dolores his sole beneficiary. Walter died on April 1, 1990, of what was ruled natural causes. However, just three days after Walter changed his will, Jerome Phillips and Darlene began talking about killing Walter to activate the will. 
They soon included Dolores in their conversations, and the trio spoke about how to hasten Walter's death seven or eight more times. One plan was to put nitroglycerin and sleeping pills in Walter's tea, but they ruled this out. In mid-March 1990, they finally decided on using a pillow over Walter's face. Dolores planned it, and they even acted it out with Darlene standing in as Walter. On the evening of March 31, 1990, Darlene told her husband and her sister that they were going to have to do something to Walter if he was still alive the next day. When they woke up, Walter was still alive, so they sent Robin, Dolores' daughter, out to walk the dog. After Robin left, Dolores sat at the kitchen table roughly 17 feet from Walter's bed, while Darlene retrieved a pillow from her bedroom. Dolores could not see what was going on at Walter's bed, but Jerome held the pillow over Walter's face for three to four minutes while Darlene held Walter's arms. When Jerome finished, Dolores stood up and embraced him. Because if things weren't already twisted and interwoven, Jerome and Dolores were having an affair. Jerome would later say he loved Dolores and that it had initially been her idea to kill Walter saying they wouldn't have to worry about being kicked out in the street if Walter was dead. An earlier attempt on Walter's life by Darlene would be the trio's undoing for Walter's murder. On August 20th, 1989, a fire broke out in Walter's home. He was asleep on the couch in the living room and was saved by a neighbor who saw the fire. Darlene was later charged with arson and on August 7th, 1990, convicted of first-degree arson and sentenced to 50 years. People in Lemon said the twins were actually firebugs, that they had set fire to his farmhouse before he ever moved into town. They weren't successful with the first attempt, but they were the next day, burning the farmhouse to the ground. While Darlene was incarcerated in the Springfield Correctional Facility in Springfield, South Dakota, she befriended Gail Baskin, who became Darlene's confidant. Darlene told Gail that Walter's death had not been of natural causes, but the result of murder. Gail was able to reach Robert Overturf, who was a special agent for the Division of Criminal Investigation, or the DCI. She relayed to him that she had information about a crime that had been committed, so he and another agent visited Gail in the correctional facility. After speaking with her, they met with Darlene, who insisted that Gail also be in the room. After Darlene repeated her story to the agents and admitted she was part of the plot to kill Walter, the trio were indicted on charges of aiding and abetting both first- and second-degree murder and conspiracy to commit both first- and second-degree murder. After speaking with Darlene and Gail, agents began an investigation into Walter's death. Investigators had thought initially that Walter died after he arrived at the hospital, but later found out he was dead when the ambulance picked him up. His body was exhumed 13 months after his death. Jerome agreed to a plea deal pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit second-degree murder and agreeing to testify against his wife, Darlene, and her sister, his lover, Dolores. Jerome was sentenced to 50 years in prison, although he had requested leniency in his sentencing, saying that he had found direction in a life that had been emotionally and spiritually bankrupt. He said, Please, don't give me a long sentence so that I can become a productive citizen. Despite his request, the judge said, I would feel I would have to resign my position as judge if I did not give you the full 50 years. He said he had known Walter Gibbs personally and that Walter was a gentle soul. He said murdering Walter was a despicable act and he was going to punish Jerome for taking Walter off the face of the earth. Dolores and Darlene were tried together. During the trial, William Erdman testified as a longtime friend of Walter's. He said he had visited Walter in the fall of 1989 and said the house had a strong odor of dog urine and body odor and that Gibbs' physical condition had deteriorated and he seemed disoriented. Darlene's defense was that she only assisted with the murder of Walter because Jerome had threatened her physically. She also said he had some sort of psychological control over her and that the idea to kill Walter had been Jerome's. 
Despite this, the jury found her guilty of conspiracy to commit murder, and she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Dolores was acquitted on all charges and released at the end of the trial. However, even though Walter's most recent will had Dolores inheriting everything, his cousin filed suit to prevent Dolores from profiting off of Walter's death. After two civil trials, it was determined that Dolores could not inherit because although she was acquitted, she was at the very least aware of the conspiracy to commit murder. Walter was well-liked by all who knew him. Many said he was a sucker for a hard luck story and that he was perhaps too forgiving. When he moved to town, he played cards occasionally and took in almost anybody that was down on their luck. One close friend of Walter's said, Walter was a nice guy until he got mixed up with those nitwit twins. They're crazier than a couple of bedbugs. The same neighbor said that Dolores ran off one time with another man and they went south together. She called Walter, who asked if she would come home. She told him she would if he would buy her a brand new car and come get her. He agreed. Dolores, Jerome, and Arlene all had run-ins with the law before these incidents. Dolores and Jerome had met while they were both incarcerated, he for writing bad checks, she for committing arson. The reports of Dolores' past run-ins were not located, although just a few months after Walter died, after Darlene was in prison, Dolores and Jerome were arrested for rustling livestock. Jerome received an eight-year sentence and Dolores received 60 days. Jerome Phillips completed his sentence on October 1, 2018, and no additional information could be found on him or the twins. The murder of Walter Gibbs made local headlines, but our next case made national headlines and was covered on 48 Hours. The victim was the mother of two who went missing for a while, so local news covered the case in an effort to assist law enforcement's efforts. On July 24, 2003, Heather Springer DeWild, a 30-year-old mother of two, went missing. Heather was in the middle of a divorce with the final hearing just a week away. On the day of her disappearance, Heather went to her estranged husband's home. Daniel DeWild had a check Heather needed to sign and also had the children's insurance cards. Two days prior to her disappearance, Daniel had gone to Heather's parents' home with cards and flowers in a last-ditch effort to reconcile with Heather but he ended up leaving angry. When Heather went to Daniel's home, she took their two children, ages three and five, with her. She had not visited Daniel alone at all during their separation. Her father, Dave Springer, had asked her not to go, but she did. When Heather did not return that afternoon, her mother, Carol, called Daniel and asked after Heather. Daniel told Carol that Heather had gone shopping. Carol told him that was simply not true. She and Dave both knew Heather had left the house without credit cards or money, and she would not leave her children behind, even with their father. Carol raced to Daniel's to pick up the children. They did not know where their mother had gone. Carol and Dave contacted the police, who looked around Daniel's home, but did not find anything. Still, nothing was sitting well with Heather's father. The next morning, a detective from the Denver Police Department was officially assigned to the case. He discovered that the divorce was becoming acrimonious because Heather had been granted temporary custody and Daniel had to pay child support. Dave said Daniel liked being in control of everything, and he had been losing control recently, particularly financially. When Eric Kreider, the detective, visited with Daniel DeWilde, Daniel quickly told Eric that he had an attorney who advised him not to speak to the police. This set off warning bells for the detective, which became loud clacks and alarms when Daniel's twin, David, pulled into the driveway. Daniel immediately started shouting, Don't talk to them. Something else that immediately struck the detective as strange was that David was taking his Suburban to a mechanic, even though David and Daniel were both mechanics. On July 25, 2003, investigators spoke with Heather's son, who said his father had been sneaking up on her back. He also told investigators he did not know why his mother and father had been fighting. On July 30, 2003, cadaver dogs were used to search David DeWild's suburban. 
the dogs hit on a scent in the vehicle. Police informed David of the results on July 31, 2003, and on August 1st, David married his girlfriend, Roseanne. Roseanne allegedly said they were married, just in case something happens, and so I couldn't testify against him. On August 4th, 2003, Heather's 1996 white Nissan Sentra was found abandoned at an apartment complex five miles from Daniel's home. Investigators searched the car but found nothing, not even Heather's fingerprints. However, a bloodhound identified the last person who sat in the driver's seat. It was Daniel DeWild. Investigators spoke with witnesses in the area where the car was found. Witnesses observed a red convertible with a black top across the street from where a white Nissan Sentra was parked on July 24, 2003, around lunchtime. David DeWild was driving a red Chrysler LeBaron convertible with a black top that day. Additionally, David's cell phone records show a call that hit the cell tower in that area at 1.11 p.m. at a time when Daniel, David, and Roseanne all said they were home. A witness saw the trio acting in a suspicious manner at 4 o'clock p.m. after Heather's disappearance. The witness said he saw the three of them on the eastbound side of Highway 6 in a pull-off. A white Nissan Sentra and a black truck were on the side of the road, along with Roseanne, David, and Daniel. There was what appeared to be a body in a bag on the ground at their feet. A month after Heather's car was found, on September 4, 2003, An employee with the Colorado Department of Transportation was moving debris along Highway 6, 10 miles west of Golden, Colorado, when he unearthed a grisly discovery. He found trash bags wrapped with silver duct tape and inside decomposing remains. Law enforcement contacted Dave Springer to locate Heather's dental records, and the family also provided DNA material. On September 8th, Investigators announced the remains were those of Heather Springer. There's honestly nothing more important than taking care of yourself. Because if you're not feeling your best, you can't be your best. Sambucol helps you feel your best with powerful immune support, powered by nature's superfruit, black elderberry. Now listen, I'm a new mom, so I don't have time to feel down and out, so I make sure to incorporate my Sambucol in my everyday life. It has been something really, really important to start off my day. I feel like I'm taking control with Sambucol because it helps support my immune system, and I feel like I'm doing my body good by taking Sambucol every day. It has a great taste. I honestly love the gummies the best, so sometimes I feel like starting off my day with a nice warm cup of water. And I'll actually use the Sambucol drink powder in there, and it tastes so good. It's really, really refreshing and makes me feel like it's an easy thing to incorporate into my wellness routine. Best of all, Sambucol is a trusted brand. It's the original black elderberry and was developed by a virologist, so I know I'm getting a great quality product. And you can too. Get 15% off your next order of $9.99 or more at sambucolusa.com. Use FAN15 for 15% off. That's sambucolusa.com. Use FAN15 for 15% off. S-A-M-B-U-C-O-L-U-S-A dot com. Use FAN15 for 15% off. Back again to talk about FunJet. Now, I don't know about you, but I want a vacation that can make the fun happen. For me, the best parts of a vacation are the ones that surprise you. And just like FunJet, I call those fun expected moments. And I get those from FunJet Vacations. FunJet Vacations offers vacation packages to your favorite destinations such as Mexico, the Caribbean, Florida, Hawaii, and more. For over 45 years, they've delivered friendly, reliable service so you can focus on the fun. Right now, you can use promo code FJ50 to save $50 on your next FunJet vacation. Get more moments that are fun expected. You deserve them. Surprise yourself where you could go at funjet.com or call your local travel advisor. Restrictions apply. After a long day, I just want to curl up on the couch and get lost in a gripping story with characters I can love and hate. Is that too much to ask? 
Nope. Thanks to Sundance Now, I always have something to watch that's binge-worthy and that I can be obsessed with. Sundance Now is an ad-free streaming service created by AMC Network for people who obsess over riveting storytelling and fresh perspectives. They've got shows like the hit British series A Discovery of Witches. It's the perfect mix of period drama, romance, and edge-of-your-seat thriller. Seasons 1 and 2 are streaming now, and Season 3, the final season, unfortunately, is streaming January 8th. I highly recommend vegging the first and second seasons of The Discovery of Witches because I really fell in love with the characters of Matthew and Diana, so I think you will too. You can stream Sundance Now on all your favorite devices for as low as $4.99 a month. Just download the app or watch online and discover exclusive shows from around the world instantly. I found my next TV obsession on Sundance Now, and you will too. Try Sundance Now free for 30 days by going to SundanceNow.com and use promo code TCFC. That's SundanceNow.com code TCFC for 30 days of free streaming. SundanceNow.com code TCFC. Heather's body was found with rope tied loosely around her wrists and neck, and a duct tape mask was found. She was still wearing the clothes she'd been wearing when she was last seen alive. In November 2003, a custody dispute for Heather and Daniel's children was resolved out of court. The court case involved Heather's parents, Daniel, and social services. The final custody was awarded to Heather's parents. Temporary custody had been awarded to them after Heather's body was found. However, there was no physical evidence implicating Daniel or David DeWild or anyone else. The case stalled and went cold for two years. In 2005, two years after Heather's murder, Jefferson County elected a new district attorney, Scott Story. Dave and Carol went to him and expressed their pain and frustration at the lack of resolution on the case and asked him if he would reopen it. A task force was formed, but there was still no movement on the case. In 2009, an investigator was assigned full-time to the case, which made a world of difference. The investigator found a copy of a sex tape that Heather and Daniel had made years before, which showed Daniel's fascination with bondage. Some of the knots on the video were similar to those found on Heather's body. Something else investigators found was Daniel's dating profile, established before Heather's remains were found. In the profile, Daniel had described himself as a widower. Despite the lack of forensic evidence, a grand jury indicted Daniel, David, and Roseanne DeWild, and on December 14, 2011, they were arrested for the murder of Heather DeWild. Investigators still had to gather enough evidence to get a conviction. They hoped they could get one of the DeWitts to turn against the others, but felt certain that the twins would remain tight-lipped. Therefore, their hope was Roseanne. However, to their surprise, it was David who turned against his twin, Daniel. Nine years after Heather's murder, David admitted he had hidden her body after his brother had murdered her. David said that Daniel had started planning on killing Heather as soon as he was ordered to pay child support in April 2003. David said he tried to talk Daniel out of the murder, but his twin finally said he was going to do it, with or without David's help. David said he agreed because he knew if he didn't help, his brother would be caught. On August 4, 2012, David went back to the house and walked investigators through what happened to Heather. David said Heather and the kids arrived at the house around noon, and he gave one last try at getting Daniel to stop. David said, and I, I stopped him right when he was walking up, and I'm in his way, and I say, Dan, don't fucking do this. But he was very calm. While the kids played, Daniel lured Heather into the garage. Prosecutors believe he told her he was going to give her the sex tape. David said Heather walked into the garage and said, What did you want to show me? And Daniel just grabbed her by both shoulders and threw her down on the ground. She tried to get up and looked at David. At this moment, David DeWild could have saved Heather, but chose not to. David said she was trying to get up, but Daniel grabbed a mallet and hit her with it, and she dropped back down. 
Daniel then put a noose around Heather's neck and hung her from the rafters with the pulley system he had rigged up. Investigators found notches in the beam in the garage. David left and took Heather's car to the apartment complex where it was eventually found. While he was gone, Dan had already placed Heather's body in the suburban. David said he checked to make sure she was not breathing. David shed light on one of the biggest mysteries surrounding Heather's murder. Why wasn't any type of DNA found? Daniel and David were huge fans of crime shows like CSI. From watching CSI, they learned that new razors cannot be traced. So a new disposable razor was used to cut the ropes that bound Heather. They learned to wear double gloves and long sleeves so that they would not leave hair or skin cells. Of course, both brothers had reason to be concerned about leaving DNA. Since they are identical twins, that means their DNA is identical too. The twins had different locations in mind for Heather's body, but David's suburban had transmission problems, so he was forced to hide her along the highway where she was eventually discovered. Before they agreed to a plea deal, investigators insisted David DeWilde take a polygraph exam so they could determine the veracity of his statements. He had lied for nine years, so they had reason to be very skeptical. However, he passed all questions pertaining to Heather's death. The only questions that were inconclusive were questions about whether his wife, Roseanne, was involved. In the end, all charges against Roseanne were dropped for lack of evidence. After being in jail for eight months, she was released. Roseanne's mother said in an interview for CBS 48 Hours that it was hard to separate the good David from the bad David. David's attorneys contacted Roseanne's mother and told her that David had confessed, and she told the attorney he was lying. She did not believe it until David called her himself. Roseanne's mother said Roseanne's only sin was loving David. When Daniel finally went to trial, David was the state's star witness. Daniel's attorney said that David only came forward and cast the blame on Daniel because David committed the crime and was afraid of spending his life in prison. As it was, David's plea bargain provided a sentence of 12 years in prison for testifying against Daniel. Defense attorneys also argued that Daniel never knew what happened to Heather after she left his house. The attorney said that David admitted to moving Heather's car and disposing of her body, so it was hard to believe David didn't commit the murders. The defense said David had always said Heather was attracted to him, so he thought after her divorce from Daniel was complete, she and David could be together. Prosecutor said this was ludicrous because David wasn't the one who could lose his house or kids. All that was Daniel. Prosecutors further argued that if David was guilty, he would not have implicated himself by coming forward. Although defense attorney said his plea bargain was reason enough, by all accounts, though, Daniel was the controlling twin who could manipulate David into almost anything. David also told prosecutors that Daniel had proposed they each kill the other's ex-wife. However, the judge would not let that information into the trial as it was too prejudicial. David DeWilde's ex-wife, Vicky, said the twins were in sync on everything, from their jobs to the pornography taste. She said that Daniel was the alpha in the relationship and that David just went along with what Daniel wanted. However, David also had a violent streak, choking her out during a fight about sex line charges. Daniel, on the other hand, told a neighbor during a yard sale that Heather was ruining his life. The neighbor said Daniel had his fists and jaw clenched and he seemed enraged. Jurors seemed to see both sides of the story and questioned David's credibility. Daniel's trial ended in a hung jury with two holdout jurors in the end. At the beginning of the jury's deliberations, the jury was split evenly on the charge of murder in the first degree. Shortly after the mistrial, Daniel decided to plead guilty to murder in the second degree. The judge sentenced him to 74 years in prison, which was one year less than what prosecutors requested. Daniel will be eligible for parole, but only after he serves his sentence. The judge said that Daniel had destroyed so many lives, including his two children's lives, who he claimed to love. Quote, he killed their mother. He did it brutally, and then he lied about it for years. I'd just like to say that Daniel 
destroy the life of his children. He destroyed the life of his own family members, all for unnecessary greed and ego that accomplished nothing. David DeWilde apologized to Heather's family, saying, I feel horrible about the pain. All I can say is I'm sorry. I'm just sorry for all the pain I've caused. Dan, on the other hand, passed on the opportunity to say anything to Heather's family in the courtroom. The family and prosecutors believe Daniel had no remorse at all. And in fact, according to prosecutors, David thought he enjoyed knowing the pain he had inflicted. He thought Daniel went to bed every night knowing that Dave Springer thought he killed his daughter and couldn't prove it. In the end, the two inseparable twins no longer speak and were housed in different prisons. Although they share identical DNA, the one thing they did not share was a conscience. David had one, whereas Daniel did not. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review and rating on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFCPod, Facebook.com slash TCFCPodcast, we're back on our Instagram account at True Crime Fan Club Pod, and of course, our website is TrueCrimeFanClub.com. You can also find me on Spotify Greenroom every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Central, 7 Eastern, to talk about every true crime topic imaginable. If you have an episode request, send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was written and researched by Susie St. John, content editing by Brittany Martinez. Produced by the best in the business, Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com.